right, so here we go. So I heard that uh, presentations go better with the uh, German hats, so I'm going to try this. <laughs> so just to tell you about the Q&A in the end, we have uh, a Git repository, or if you go to GitHub uh, below the Webpack organization, you will find uh, this repository. And then you get the question, and then you open an issue. So please open issues, so we will open, uh, and we will answer in the, in the end, end of this meetup. And uh, actually, uh, why I'm here in Augsburg, it actually has to do with, uh, with training. I'm, I'm training people, you know, uh, workshops and stuff. So maybe you can check out the offering later if you're interested and, and see if we can work together. But uh, that's, that's enough about the uh, background. I think I'll just jump to the presentation. So it's, it's going to be quite short and you will have time for questions. But it's about uh, reimagining Webpack or even reimagining my life because it's kind of it's kind of funny how our destinies are tied together. So uh, me and Webpack, how we relate to each other. So I think uh, it all kind of started in 2012 uh, when Tobias made a pull request against a certain bundle, and it didn't go through. So he had to start writing his own bundle. So it was I guess lucky day for me. Uh, one year later, I started seeing these Webpack config files in projects. I really didn't understand what, what it's about, but so I just kind of discarded it. Uh, but then one day, I found a project, React Hot Loader. So it had like maybe three stars, uh, but I was using React at the time. So I decided that, yeah, this looks good. And yeah, the GIF is great. So let's start using this. And it kind of drove me to Webpack because it happened to use Webpack as well. So it, it was kind of a starting point for me. And then 2014, uh, there was a good blog post. It doesn't even exist anymore by Cristiano Foni about Webpack. And uh, I noticed a couple of things in the post and I like to comment on people's blog posts. I mean, sometimes maybe like one of the hundred posts, but anyway. So I made a little comment and I mentioned that maybe we should write, uh, write a little cookbook about Webpack because it's a tool that needs better documentation. So a short while later, we started writing the cookbook and this actually became my first book, as you will see. And the book itself, the paper version, it, was, it became ready this year, this April. So it took like a couple of years to get that done. Uh, uh, two months forward, uh, I started pitching the book idea to publisher and they said, no, we are not going to do this. So I started doing my own book. And it actually became my own business, and it's the reason why I'm here. And then, 2016, I got my first book out. The scope grew. It was about Webpack and React, so two topics in one. So the next logical step was to split it up into two books. And then, July, uh, about a year ago, we set up a core team of four people. We added one, pe one person later, but uh, it was like, uh, one way I got more involved with the project. Before that, I had, I had done some documentation work and so on, and mostly just uh, tagging issues and just helping helping out a bit. And this year, January, we're back to. It was a great milestone release. And yeah, March, we got the Webpack book on, on paper. And a bit more uh, forward in, in May, uh, I, uh, they gave me a title. I'm Finnish code ambassador, whatever that means. So I got this block of wood. It's on my on my wall at home. But uh, they gave me some title for, for the work I've been doing for the past few years. Uh, it was maybe two, three weeks ago we got Webpack 3. So, so now we have different currents. But uh, I guess the question is, uh, these things happen, but why did Webpack become, become popular? So I will blame it on Pete Hunt. So he, had, he was developing on Instagram. They had very big JavaScript application and that's problematic when you have Instagram. So he decided to so do something about it. He found Webpack. I think it, it had something to do with code splitting and he started using it and he started advertising it. So it always helps to find someone really famous or like someone with a lot of influence to push your product. Because what happened next? is that the React community picked up. So we had React Hot Loader, a lot of good things happened. So it, it really popularized the tool in, in React community. 
and it's more or less the tool of choice if you have a React project. And then you see projects like Angular using it, and Vue and WordPress and so on. So it's this cascade. Uh, of course, when you think about features, I would say code splitting is maybe the most important ones when it comes to popularity. And of course, hot model replacement, because it was so visual, it was easy to get into Webpack due to that, uh, that uh, React for thing in the past. And this is the, this was the, I mean, it doesn't look like much, but I would say it's the fundamental idea of Webpack uh, code split. So you get separate chunk out of this separate bundle. And in, in terms of craft, you will have like, like big application and you will, you will have vendor bundle and you will have tons of splits. Uh, something far more complicated, but I mean, this is what you get out of Webpack quite easily. Uh, and there's supposed to be a craft, yeah. So you see it was uh, a long time it was in zero and then it started growing, growing and growing. And you see this dip and you know what that means. It means Christmas because <laughs> yes, because uh, coders, they don't work in Christmas. So you see this in every popular project. Uh, yeah. So you actually see it my, in my project, Webpack Merge. You have the same dip. Because when I was writing the first book, I noticed that it's actually quite complex to configure Webpack in the same way. So I solved it in, a, in my own little way. So I solved it through composition. So I wrote the tiny tool to do just that. But when it, com when it comes to Webpack documentation, it used to look like this. So we have this animation. Yeah, and then you have this image. And then you have some code. And I mean, what's that? So it was very hard for me to get into Webpack for this reason. I think the old documentation works if you know how Webpack works already. So, but I mean, that was kind of the problem. So you get, we got a lot of this kind of feedback. I mean, there's Arando, which said Webpack documentation sucks. So <laughs> there, there must be some truth to it. So we did something about it. So there's a new flashy site. So now we have different approach. We have a little different uh, architecture when it comes to like explaining. So we have concepts because I think that, that was the big thing missing from the old documentation. Because if you don't understand the concepts behind the tool, you cannot understand the tool. And we also added guides how to do specific things. I think the new documentation is it's actually too good because it, it hurts my book sales. But you know, but yeah, now, now the site makes more sense and you, you get the basic idea really well. And you can also see that, yeah, we have a lot of support supporters. So there are a lot of companies and individuals behind the projects. So how did we do it? Well, we started last June. So because we decided that we cannot publish Webpack 2 before we have a good site to support it. And it took a few months, but in December we had the MVP done. I wouldn't say that the current site is perfect, but I think it's, it's a little better than the old one. Uh, I started the project by redesigning the information architecture of the, of the project. So I, I set up some kind of structure. I didn't do that much writing on actual documentation. It was more about like pushing it to the right direction. And the nice thing to notice was that when you have like a skeleton, something where to put content, then just pe people come and fill the skeleton. So you get like actual product out of it. And we put some focus on the process. So we want to push uh, like uh, aspects to automation. So we do some linting and, and things like that. But uh, since the beginning, we have had well over 700 pull requests maybe 800, 900, I, I don't know the exact figure, but hundreds of people have contributed to the new documentation. We host it on top of GitHub pages, we have automated deployments, and, and there, yeah, there's the linting part. Uh, one day I noticed that when, when I went through Webpack plugins and loaders, I noticed that the readme files, they are not that great. So I did the next thing, I, I did the best thing I could, I could do, or I, or I knew to do. I, I picked up the readme files and I exposed them to the public through the site. So when you see that something is ugly, people are really willing to fix it. So I think uh, that was one way we, in which we improved the quality of, of Webpack documentation and Webpack Lotus readers. So by exposing ugly things, you can kind of fix them sometimes. Uh, it's quite easy to edit 
the whole documentation. So you go go to the site, there's edit button, you click the button, you do, do your edit, and we, we might accept it to the documentation. Uh, one interesting thing is that we have voting. So you can go to the vote page, and you might have some influence, like golden influence or normal influence. I have golden influence, so if I wanted constant hashing in Webpack, I will I could push it to the top. But I don't I don't think I'll do it now. But uh, I mean, we have some we have this kind of uh, way to way to uh, push push development to certain direction if you want, and it's it's like community driven in a way. So now you see that people want persistent caching. So maybe that's the big next big feature that's going to happen. Uh, and this is the site generator. It's, it's actually it has one real user. It's me, so it's it's written for me by me. So it, it's perfect. <laughs> but uh, and I will not succeed using it. I don't want to support you. So please don't go to the site and check it out. But I would say the story of Webpack is a story of uh, how to go from one developer to many. I I would say we are still doing this. So we are still scaling the effort and figuring out how to do this in a smart way. But I think it's essential because it's so it's so important tool at the moment. It's too important tool to lose. So how do we scale it? So we had that core team last year. Uh, we set up Open Collective because most developers they don't like to work for free, or I mean some do, but I mean you still want food on the table and so on. So we have Open Collective. So it's donation-based model. So companies, individuals, they can. Uh, kind of reward, uh, they can fund us through this it's kind of working model. Uh, we also have that sec secret slack, you, you cannot get in, but it's, it's awesome. Uh, we also set up uh, Webpack Contrib, because uh, I noticed that uh, with about the slack, if you contribute enough, we will let you in, so don't worry. Uh, so about uh, Webpack Contrib, so it was this year, January. Uh, I noticed that we have these little packages related to Webpack that are behind individuals. And the problem is that once the person is gone, disappears from the internet, uh, where we are kind of stuck. So I decided that maybe we need to adopt some of these packages into a single place. Well, one day I woke up and I noticed that it had like 40 packages. So what happened is that Tobias had pushed all orders and plugins to this place. So essentially we split the effort. So we have Webpack Core and we have Webpack Contrib and contrib is for for those plugins and like periphery, so it it's uh it's like one way to scale the effort. So we have different teams on working on core and and contrib. But yeah, the open collective it went forward, so we got some funding, and it's still going forward, I think. And this year, April, uh, Tobias was able to drop his old work, uh, and just go full time on Webpack. And in May, it was announced that uh, Mozilla will, will sponsor the project. Uh, in, in near future, so it, it, this will be big uh, if and when it goes through. And Open Collective, it keeps, it, it keeps growing. Of course, if you think about it, uh, 100k, it's like enough for one develop, developer. So maybe we want 200k one day, but we can only hope. About Contrib, so yeah, separate efforts. We have focus on this third party package, but it's, it's still important. So we went to 40 packages quite fast. But the problem with is that we had like 40 snowflakes. So 40 projects that are somehow a little different. So how to manage all that? So then we ended up with a little team, let's say five to six active people. But we have this challenge. We have years and years of technical depths. How to get that in control? So we understood that, yeah, we need automation. We need some discipline uh, because uh, in the ideal world, we can just merge pull requests and and uh, get new releases out without uh, tons of effort. So that led to idea. Uh, it's something I, I and Artem Sapegin figured out. Uh, it has to do with uh, with this snowflake problem because when you have different setups, it's really annoying to manage. So we decided that maybe need, maybe we need one way to kind of manage project defaults. So we set up Webpack defaults because it's, you know, defaults. So I'll, I'll show you really quickly how this works. So I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate. It's like, uh, I mean, let's do this. So it's going to install it. Right. And Vim, not MX. So, oops, sorry. 
So now we have a new command, and I'm doing the smartest thing you can. So I'm going to run an unknown com command from internet. So anything can happen. So it's, it's doing something, some, something magical. So, so here we go. So now we have something here. And now we have like dot files, we have Babel RC, editor config, ESLint, and blah blah blah. A lot of boring little files, but you most of projects they need these files. So essentially what actually happened is that we pushed all this boring boring work to one place. And that's it. So what, what's going to happen or what's happening right now is that we are pushing loaders and plugins to use this package. And the point is quite simple. So whenever we make changes to these defaults, like ESLint config. We update the package on these loaders and plugins, and then we run npm run webpack default. Uh, now it will patch the project with the new changes. So instead of snowflakes, we have like one place to patch, and then we, we can cascade the changes everywhere we want. And it's actually it's a migration tool for project configuration, but what actually happened is that we kind of uh, reinvented Yoman. So we wrote the migration tool and got a Yeoman as a side effect. So we didn't really focus on writing initialization tool, but we got it for free. And this is actually cool because now you can start your loader or plugin project against Webpack defaults. But you can study it later and understand the implementation is kind of, kind of cool. And pleading it, not a lot of people know always. So yeah, I did the demo, so I, I'll skip this. So you install it and you run it, and then you get this complexity in a package. And the tool behind it is actually MRM. So it's at like it's like 35 stars. So people don't understand the power, but it's it's a really powerful concept. So you know database migration, so think migration tool, but for project configuration. So how about the future? So we are going to push this to country projects. So we get higher quality with, with less effort. And of course, a project like Webpack, it gets a lot of feedback. So we get tons of issues. So whatever we can do to decrease the amount of like individual effort to decrease that, it's, it's worth it. So like one example of doing that is that we have a bot. So we have this little bot uh, that can do things for us. It can, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll show you one thing really quick. So the problem is that people go and they, they are like, yes, new issue. And yeah, let's forget that and let's write this and that. And now we get issue that doesn't have a lot of value. So actually a bot when done right, it can close the issue. Or sometimes they are like, uh, yeah, there's this and that wrong in documentation, but they push it to main repository. So we can tell the bot to move the issue because GitHub doesn't implement uh, issue move. We cannot move issues using GitHub itself between repositories. So we can tell the bot, please bot, please move this issue from this repository to another repository. So it's just uh, decreasing this, uh, this effort. And it also deals with pull requests. So it, it, it gives some feedback, it takes some work out of the process. So, but yeah, I would say there's still a lot of work to do. So if we can figure out ways to decrease the amount of support, it's all the better because then we get less issues and we can focus on the right things. And I would say there's work to do in maybe we can make it easier to par parallelize Webpack. So because now it's going to run in a single instance, and then you're wasting your your, your like precious processor because it's 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 mostly doing nothing. We also get this uh, support for Web Assembly, and uh, that has to do with the Mozilla support. And then we have the voting, so we get the features the community wants. And yeah, and then there's the book which you can go and you can find it online. There's actually a free version, so you can read it online. If you like it, uh, please buy it. Uh, because, I mean, it helps us to develop these things. And there's also the paper version. But uh, I think uh, that's it for me this time. And yeah, I just made it in Norge. So if you have questions, I can take a few. Yeah, maybe you can take the mic.
Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, cool to hear. Yeah, I mean, it's some of the strains. I mean, I went to Norway like in April, and then some girl came came to me, and she came to me with with the first book, and she asked autograph. It's it's totally strange. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a question. Um, so, do you have any kind of uh, time frame for for web assembly? Do you want to do that? Or? Yeah, so I'm completely wrong person to answer that. So we have to ask <laughs> Tobias because he's going to implement it on me. So. Yeah, but I guess, I mean, it, it's usually like this in Finland. So you ask, does anyone have questions? And everyone is like silent. And they, they actually have questions, but they don't ask, ask them. So it's like, I don't know, it's, it's the same culture. <laughs> but I guess it's, uh, it's my turn to leave. And they replace me with someone else. All right, thanks. <laughs>